The pigment type switch explained for horse people. This is a bay horse. How come there are not only bay horses, but also blacks and chestnuts? What genes are responsible for this? And how do they interact? The concept we need to understand these colors is called the pigment type switch. It explains the distribution of red and black color on the horse. You may already be familiar with the letters A and E as codes for a horse's color. We will now get a closer look at what is behind these symbols. As a heads up, some parts of this presentation are simplified for better understanding. We cannot dive into all the details and exceptions in this short video. First though, we need to tackle some basic biology. Our bodies, as well as the bodies of all living things, are made of cells. There are many different types of cells, and each has their specific job. There are muscle cells, red blood cells, neurons in the brain, and there are cells that produce color for our skin and hairs. Inside each cell, there is the nucleus. It contains the chromosomes where all the genetic information is stored. Chromosomes are made up of extremely long strings of DNA. But what is a gene? A gene is a stretch of DNA that contains a recipe for something the cell has to build, usually a protein. Whenever the cell needs to assemble a certain protein, a little copier machine reads the gene on the DNA strand. The copy of the recipe is then sent outside of the nucleus and to little factories in the cell. These factories then assemble the desired protein. Whenever a gene has wrong information on it, for example due to a mutation, the factory cannot make the correct protein and something in the body could be missing or go wrong. The color found in skin and hair is called pigment. In mammals, there are two kinds of pigment, which we can see in this bay horse, a reddish pigment and a blackish one. The reddish pigment is called pheomelanin. Black pigment is called eumelanin. Both can come in a range of shades, from very dark to quite light, depending on what other genes are at play and also on the animal's environment. When a hair grows on a horse's body, it needs to be filled with pigment. The cells that take this job are called melanocytes. They sit on the root of the developing hair. Here we can see a melanocyte. It has a nucleus and little factories that help create pigment. This is a complex process with many steps and source materials. Hundreds of genes play a role in it. The pigment granules that the melanocyte builds are called melanosomes. Black ones look like rice grains, while red ones are round as a ball. The cell delivers the melanosomes to the growing hair with its tentacle-like protrusions. All cells are enclosed by a wall, called the cell membrane. On the left we see the inside of a melanocyte cell, on the right is the outside part. Cells need to get material in and out all the time, for example the chemicals needed to synthesize melanosomes. There are several ways to make this happen, for example through little channels in the membrane. But cells not only receive material, they also receive messages from other cells or from the brain. Hormones are one type of such messages. These messages don't need to get inside the cell, they are received by a receptor on the cell wall. Whenever the receptor receives a message from the outside, it will send out a signal on the inside so the cell knows what it has to do. In the case of the melanocyte, the message could say, a new hair is growing, start making pigment. We saw that mammals have two kinds of pigment, eumelanin and pheomelanin. How does the cell know which of those it has to produce? The default state for every melanocyte is to make pheomelanin, that is red pigment. The receptor responsible for the switch between red and black pigment is called melanocortin-1 receptor or MC1R. 
One of the signals that can bind to this receptor and activate it is called alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, or short, alpha MSH. It fits into the receptor like a key into a lock. Whenever alpha MSH binds to MC1R, the receptor sends out a signal on the inside of the cell, causing it to create black eumelanin instead of red pheomelanin. Alpha MSH is a hormone secreted by the brain. Usually there is a lot of it floating around in the cells, so the melanocytes are stimulated to make eumelanin, black pigment. Alpha MSH is encoded by a gene named POMC or proopiomelanocortin. That is, POMC is the recipe for making alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. But POMC also codes for some other hormones. Some of them have to do with food and weight. Now, what happens when the POMC gene is broken? The body cannot produce alpha MSH, so nobody tells the receptor to make black pigment. The result is an old red animal, and also an obese one. The POMC gene usually works fine in horses, but in humans, POMC deficient children are light haired, fair skinned, and obese. This is an important concept. When genes are faulty, we get faulty proteins, missing hormones, wrong cells, etc., which can affect the animal. Many color genes only change the animal's color when they are broken, but some also have other undesired effects on the body. So, in horses, there is usually plenty of alpha MSH telling the cells to make black. But now, an important player comes into the picture. A good signaling protein, or ASIP. It can also bind to MC1R, just like alpha MSH. ASIP is called an antagonist of alpha MSH, because only one of the two can bind to the receptor. But ASIP is stronger, so when it is present, Alpha MSH has no chance. When ASIP binds to the receptor, it silences it, so the receptor no longer sends out a signal on the inside of the cell and therefore the melanocyte produces red pigment. But what if the ASIP gene is broken and there is no ASIP around the cells? In that case, Alpha MSH is in charge and keeps telling the melanocyte to make black pigment. Now we saw what happens when one of the signalers on the outside is missing. When there is no alpha MSH, the animal will be red, and when there is no ASIP, the animal will be black. But what about the receptor? If MC1R is broken or absent, that also changes things. Alpha MSH and ASIP now have nowhere to bind. No receptor means the cell never gets signals from the outside, so it will just make the default red. This is why MC1R is epistatic to ASIP, meaning that once MC1R is gone, it doesn't matter if ASIP is there or not. It won't make a difference, since ASIP has nowhere to bind. A bay horse has working MC1R and ASIP. But why does it have black and red in its coat? How come the ASIP doesn't tell cells all over the body to make red? The ASIP gene, which is the recipe for the ASIP protein, has several stretches that code for different types of ASIP, called isoforms. One type will work as described above, while the other will not. The cells know where in the body they are and based on that positional identity, they will make only one of the two ASIP types. Cells in the mane, tail and legs will make a non-working form, while cells in the rest of the animal produce the one that can bind to MC1R and signal for red. Now that we understand what happens in the pigment-producing cells, we can go on to see how a horse's genotype influences its phenotype. Genotype is what the genetic code says, and phenotype is what you can actually see on the outside. Do you remember the nucleus? It is the place inside the cell that contains all the chromosomes with its DNA. Now every animal has two copies of the same chromosome, one from its father and one from the mother. These chromosomes contain the same genes, 
but they are never completely identical. There are always some small differences. Every melanocyte has not just one, but many, even hundreds of MC1R receptors. As long as there is one good copy of the MC1R gene, the cell can produce these receptors. If there is only one good gene, it will maybe not have as many receptors, but the ones it has are still able to receive the signals. That is why the working variant of the gene is dominant over the broken one, because one good copy is enough to keep things working. Only when both copies are broken, there is a change, which is why the broken variant is recessive. The same is true with ASIP. One good gene is enough to produce enough ASIP protein to effectively signal for red. So here too, the working copy is dominant, while the broken one is recessive. Early geneticists didn't know much about how genes actually worked, but they invented letter symbols to visualize the genotypes. The MC1R gene was known to them as the E locus. E stands for extension. They chose this word because in some variants of this gene, there is black pigment only in the skin, while in other variants, the black pigment extends into the hair. We have come across two variants of this gene so far. Gene variants are also called alleles. The intact allele of the MC1R gene, which is able to produce a working receptor, is symbolized by an uppercase E. The broken allele of the gene, which does not produce a working MC1R receptor, is represented by a lowercase e. Uppercase alleles are dominant, while lowercase ones are recessive. We already saw that one intact MC1R copy is enough, therefore, this allele is dominant and has an uppercase letter. Remember that every animal has two copies of each gene. Now let's see what combinations we can get of the two alleles. First, there can be two good copies, which we note down with two uppercase E's. There could be one good copy and one broken, which we will note down with an uppercase and a lowercase E. The dominant one always goes first, by the way. Or we could have two copies of the broken allele, which we will note down with two lowercase E's. The ASIP gene works very similar. Its symbol is A for agouti. An agouti is actually a little rodent from South America, with a black and red ticked fur. Since the ASIP gene is responsible for creating this kind of ticking and hair bending in many mammals, that name was given to the gene. The intact allele of agouti signaling protein is represented by an uppercase A, because, as we saw, one copy is enough and therefore it is dominant. The broken allele, on the other hand, gets a lowercase a. The possible combinations at the A locus are similar to the E locus. Two working copies are noted down with two uppercase A's. One good and one broken allele are written with an uppercase A and a lowercase A, and two broken alleles are written with two lowercase A's. It is time to put the two loci together and see what they will produce in a horse. First, let's say we have two good copies of the working MC1R gene and two copies of the working ASIP gene. This will give us a bay horse, just as it should be. If we have one good and one broken allele of E, but two good copies of A, the horse will still be bay because the one good MC1R gene is still able to create receptors. The same is true if one of the copies of ASIP is broken. The one good allele still makes everything work as it should and the horse still looks bay. But what if both our MC1R genes are broken? The melanocytes don't have any receptors and alpha MSH will not be able to tell the cell to make black. Therefore, we will get an all red horse. It doesn't matter in this case what we have at the A gene because when there are no receptors, nothing can bind to them, so it doesn't matter what we have at A. The next case is a horse with two good copies of MC1R or E, but no working ASIP. As we saw earlier, without ASIP, alpha MSH keeps binding to the receptor and th thus telling the cell to make black. There is nobody around to switch back to red, so the horse will be all black. It doesn't matter if one of the two E alleles is broken. This horse still has receptors that receive the alpha MSH signal for black, so the horse is still black. 
If, however, both of the E alleles are broken, alpha MSH cannot bind, nobody can tell the cell to make black, and the horse is red, whatever its A locus says. So let's sum up which combinations are responsible for which colors. Bays need to have one good copy of each gene, but one is enough. Reds will always have two broken copies of the E locus, but can have any combination of A. Finally, blacks need one good E allele, because they need receptors to get the signal for black, but they all have two broken copies of A. These codes can be summed up. We can put a dash in the places where it doesn't matter what allele they have. So again, a bay needs at least one good copy of each, a red always has two recessive E alleles, and a black needs at least one good E, but has two copies of recessive A. You don't need to memorize these codes. In fact, the purpose of this video is to make you understand how these genes work, so you won't have to memorize, but instead they make sense to you. If you're not quite there yet, just watch the video again or ask questions. Now you should be able to tell the phenotype from the genotype, to determine what a horse looks like from seeing the gene code. What about this horse? It has one dominant E, one recessive E, and two recessive A's. You now know that it has receptors, so it can receive signals for black. But it has no ASIP that would tell the cells on the body to make red, so the animal is all black. Now you know how the pigment search works in horses. But actually, horses are a very simple case with their bays, blacks and reds. The pigment switch is able to do much more and can create some fascinating colors in other species. There are 10 point dogs. Dogs usually have banded fur in most places and only red fur on the legs, chest and muscle. But in 10 points, the ASIP isoform responsible for banding is broken, so most of the dog is black instead of banded. There are black cows, and they are not black because of missing ASIP like horses are. Instead, their receptor has changed so that it always signals the cell to make black, even if ASIP comes around and wants to change to red. Or there are harlequin rabbits, whose MC1R gene has mutated in a way that in some places on the body it works like the ones in cows and continuously signals for black, while in other places it is broken and doesn't receive any signals for black. You see, color genetics is fascinating, and even more so if you look at many species simultaneously. If you want to learn more or still need help with this topic, feel free to ask in the comments or look for me on Facebook. There are some great groups about color genetics on Facebook, where I and others can explain these things to you in more detail. I made this video to the best of my knowledge, some concepts were simplified and the part about different isoforms in base has not been researched in horses to my knowledge, we only know how it works in mice and some other species, so the picture may end up looking a bit different from what I presented here. In case you want to go down the rabbit hole, here are some of the references I used. There are hundreds of other great scientific papers out there about the pigment switch and about color genetics in horses and other species. I hope this video helped you make sense of the pigment type switch.